Hello, epidemics. Hope everybody's doing good today. So, there's been a bit of a delay with getting assignments up on Blackboard. I'm having a strange problem getting access to Blackboard um, since the college upped their security last week. And so I did get, um, I did manage to get on and I put up something for the journal entry for this week real quick, but I haven't been able to get on again to post the quiz. So chances are very good um, that there won't end up being a quiz due this week just because I, I can't get on Blackboard. <laughs> I'm meeting with, uh, um, somebody from the, the computer security system tomorrow to see if we can figure out the problem. So there is a journal entry up. Um, there may or may not be a quiz up. The project, of course, is due before midnight on May 1st, and presentations will be next week. All right, Nate, go ahead. Hey, real quick. Um, I don't know, I don't mind presenting whenever is best for you. So if you just want to pencil something in, that's fine. Just be like, hey, you're, this time is okay with you or whatever. So either day is fine with me. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I think only one person has requested a specific date. So um, let me add that to my to-do list so I remember. to assign days. And I'll let you guys know, huh, I can't get into my email either. Um, <laughs> I will let you guys know, but I, I'll, I'm not quite sure when I'll let you know about that. Okay. So we've been talking about malaria and We've been talking about um, the new world and how the people who are native to a region in the Andes in South America were using bark from a specific tree, the chin cinchoa, cinchona tree, sorry, um, to treat fevers. And it turns out that it worked for malaria. And so of course, the European Jesuits stole that idea. And then the Dutch uh, East Indies Company stole some seeds and created plantations in other parts of the world. So they could grow these trees, extract the quinine from the bark and sell that as a medication to wealthy Europeans. So, Quinine is a very bitter tasting compound. It does not taste good. In fact, the taste is so bad that sometimes if people would uh, just chew and swallow some of the bark, they'd actually throw up. So the Europeans started mixing it with tonic water. Tonic water at the time had a lot of sugar in it. So there's the, all of this sweet, uh, sweet taste to kind of mask the bitterness. And then they started adding gin to the tonic. <laughs> and this is the origin of the gin and tonic. You beat me to it, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that one already, Jerry? I was just putting it together. I saw with this, I was like, tonic and bitter taste, and that's gin and tonic. And then you went to the gin part. I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, in fact, until pretty recently, a lot of tonic water had quinine in it, even in the US, just because that's how they made it. They didn't see any reason to change it. 
So anyway, one of the reasons that Europeans were not able to invade Africa and India was malaria. Remember, malaria is very, very deadly. And people who are native to areas with malaria have, um, first off, they have some genetic changes that help protect them. And secondly, if you get exposed to it and you survive the infection, then you've got some immunity. And repeated exposures keep that immunity going. So if you live in the area and you've survived your first case of malaria, you're not likely to be killed by later cases. So the discovery of quinine really allowed the Europeans to invade and colonize both Africa and India in the 1800s. This and the fact that the British um, developed chinchona tree plantations really helped with the creation of the Great British Empire, which was the largest empire in history. Okay. In fact, before the discovery of quinine, the Europeans called malaria or referred to malaria, they talked about, sorry, general Anopheles. The Anopheles mosquito, of course, is what spreads malaria. And general Anopheles was defending Africa and India from the Europeans. Okay, so. So if we took a poll and said, well, would you rather have malaria or um, the, you know, the UK invade? I wonder what would the answer be? Who mm. killed more people? Who dif disenfranchised their civilization more? Or what rather? That is a very good question. Um, my viewpoint is probably that the British Empire and the European colonialism was worse. I mean, and even still, there's still malaria today, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> and no, and no, Africa. No, no, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I don't know much about India pre-colonialism, but I know that Africa pre-colonialism had massive uh, civilizations. We don't know this as the average Americans. We aren't taught in school about the pre-colonial societies. Um, but there certainly were some significant cultures that we've just completely lost. All right. So we're not going to really talk about European colonialism. That's more history. But I wanna talk about a couple of specific things about malaria um, and its effects on history. And so I wanna talk about the Panama Canal. So before the Panama Canal was built, there was not an easy way to get between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. You had to either go south around the Horn of Africa, which is a very storm, um, stormy area. Lots of ships get lost in that part of the world. Or you had to go around the Cape of Good Horn at the south end of South America, which also very stormy, unpredictable winds and currents um, and icebergs. 
both of those locations, you would have to deal with these harsh conditions that made it very, very dangerous. Nate, go ahead. The canal, that was that was spearheaded by Theodore Roosevelt, right? When he was president. Or like he actively pursued its construction. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. I'm actually not sure. I don't think I wrote down who the president was. It was in the early 1900s. So, all right. He took office in 1901, so that kind of makes that makes sense. So probably, yeah, he probably started it. He would have been president when the U.S. took over construction of the Panama Canal. And of course, you can't go north around North America because the Arctic stays frozen, or at least it used to. So Panama has a stretch of land between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And yes, the Atlantic is up, but that's just because of the way Panama, it, it's actually kind of, um, almost horizontal in this area, almost east-west. So this is only about 50 miles across or 80 kilometers. So for the longest time, there was a land route. So ships could dock on either the Atlantic side or the Pacific side load their goods up and there was a railway that went from one side to the other across the Panama Canal. There were also roadways, um, but this area has a lot of malaria. You can see how much water there is around here. So lots of mosquitoes, lots of malaria and lots of yellow fever, which is a disease we are not talking about this semester. And Panama has a rainy season and it was not uncommon for part of the railroad or the, or the regular road to get washed out during the rainy season and have to be repaired. So in 1881, France decided we're gonna dig a canal and go through this area. Because you can see up at this end, there's a lot of water that was pre-existing. So we had part of the canal already built. And there's also a pretty wide river at this end. So the canal itself, the constructed part, largely consists of this area and this area. So France is like, we're just going to dig this. And they worked on it for eight years. And during these eight years, over 22,000 workers died from malaria and yellow fever. And so France says, forget it. We can't do it because of all of the diseases. In 1897, we finally learned that malaria is transmitted by mosquito. So we didn't know that before then. So we didn't know how people were catching the disease. We just knew hot, wet areas, lots of disease. And the US took over construction in 1904. The U.S. named an army physician, William Gorgas, to oversee the building of the canal. Why are we bringing in a physician to oversee a construction project? Because the biggest problem was disease. And he was an expert in yellow fever, which is also mosquito transmitted. And Gorgas, oh, Nate, go ahead. Is that... That's like dang, 
fever too, right? That falls under that yellow fever family, flavo, uh, no, 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 no. Dengue? Yeah, yeah, dengue, yeah. Yeah, yeah. dengue is another one of those, yeah. And it's parasite caused to. I don't, hmm. I don't know off the top of my head. So you can Google that while I'm talking. <laughs> All right, so Gorgas started the war on mosquitoes. And what did he do for this war on mosquitoes? Window screens, raining areas of standing water or oiling puddles. So we put a little bit of oil on the surface of a puddle, the mosquito larva cannot breathe. So they aren't gonna grow up. And fumigating buildings. Okay, so great. He knows mosquitoes are the problems. We're gonna eliminate that. There was one small catch to this, however. These fumigation of buildings and window screens were on the buildings that housed the white workers. The natives who were working were not getting that kind of protection. Even with what he did, um, and, and only protecting some people, both malaria and yellow fever were nearly eliminated from the canal zone, the area where they were working. So the war on mosquitoes really reduced the rate of disease. Okay, I didn't leave myself very much room on this screen. So if you want to screenshot this. So building the canal took 10 years and $375 million. What is 375 million in modern money? Last time I did the math, it was equivalent to $10 million today. Probably a few more, because I haven't done the math in a couple of years and inflation's been insane. During the building of the canal, America recorded the death of 5,000 609 workers. Some were lost to accident, some to disease. A lot less than France lost. But they only recorded the death of the white workers. So we have no idea how many native workers um, or black and brown workers that might have been imported or brought to the area to do this work. We have no idea how many of those died. But the work that Gorgas did in this area showed that you could reduce mosquitoes and nearly eliminate malaria. So the things that he did started to be exported to other parts of the world. And malaria was using these techniques was eliminated from most of Europe and the United States. Okay, so we're gonna go on and talk about how we eradicate the story of malaria in the United States. So I don't know if you wanna copy this or not. Wait, so um, what did the canal have to do with the disease exactly? 
the building of the canal, the biggest problem with building the canal was malaria. And Dr. Gorgas developed some techniques that helped nearly eliminate malaria from this area, which then were taken to other parts of the world where they were used to completely eliminate malaria from other parts of the world. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Say at least they didn't have to use a human vector as they did with smallpox to South America. Right. Well, malaria ended up in South America because it came across in the blood of slaves. No, cheers. I'm saying in reference for the cure because they yes. used the vector to bring them to South. So that was pretty cool. Yep. No orphan boys being stolen is the point. No orphan boys being stolen for this one. Okay, so... Malaria was relatively widespread in the United States, all the way up through New England. So Massachusetts had to deal with malaria. Um, to the east of the Rocky Mountains, I, it didn't seem to get to the west side of the Rocky Mountains, uh, where the desert, south, desert southwest and, and the west coast. Um, there were a few places like Northern Maine where it didn't get to, but most of the Eastern U.S. What, had malaria endemic. Do you guys remember that term, endemic? Okay, that means it's established and naturally occurring. Malaria was established By 1607, so very, very early. So Columbus discovered the New World, which we all know he didn't, um, but he started the European invasion in 1492. So we're talking little more than 100 years. Now, in the US, the primary species of malaria is Plasmodium vivax. Vivax is more cold hardy than Plasmodium falciparum, the more deadly version that is such a problem still in modern day Africa. So malaria persisted in the, in the southeastern U.S. until the 1940s or 1950s. So a couple of decades after we figured out how to deal with malaria, I, I'm sorry, it took a couple of decades after we figured out how to deal with malaria to actually eradicate it from all of the United States. Now, one of the biggest advantages that the US, one of the biggest things the US did was window screens. So if you go to other parts of the world, you often find that, they, that people don't have screens on the windows. Um, I was in Jamaica and died because of this. I mean, literally, I wanted to go home. It wasn't even fun. They have like a, a, a bed screen, if you will. Yep. That wasn't enough. I really hated it. It was great. I got used to it, but I would say probably 100 bikes. Because we smelled, remember you said we smelled different and we could put off scents for the mosquitoes. So I smelled different than a Jamaican person and it was literally not fun. So yeah. 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 Um. I went to, um, when I was in graduate school, I went to a, a lab in Spain for a couple of months to learn some new techniques. And 
They didn't have screens on the windows. And there were so many bugs in the house. And, you know, I'm, I'm a biologist. Bugs don't normally bother me, but you can't sleep with the windows open. I like to sleep with the windows open. <laughs> How do people live like this? I don't know. Not to mention, if the windows are open, not only can bugs come in, but stray cats, skunks. Oh, there, were, there were bats, too, fruit bats, which I didn't really understand the difference. I was a bit younger then. I was like, what's this bat doing in here? It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so window screens um, really, really helped. Places with less malaria, tend not to have window screens. I'm not sure why places with a lot of mosquitoes don't have them. But some of the other things that happened were natural wetlands were drained. So remember, mosquitoes are dependent on still water. They need still water. Water that's moving like in a river, the mosquito larva cannot survive in that. They have to breathe from the surface. So they literally drowned. The US Army Corps of Engineers did a lot of work straightening creeks and small rivers. Part of that was for navigation and part of it was to eliminate any curves that might have an area of still water where the mosquitoes could breathe. And if you go to especially the southeastern U.S., the creeks run straight. They don't meander with, with uh, the natural curves of the land. It's really bizarre. And we used aircraft to spray insecticide. Insecticides Anytime you see that ending um, C-I-D-E, that means it's killing. So herbicides kill plants. Pesticides kill pests. Rodenticides kill rodents. Insecticides kill insects. And these really started being used on the ground before we had a lot of, a lot of um, aircraft use in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Nate, go ahead. So I know that's not that suffix side. It's not just limited to like animals like genocide, homicide, suicide. Yeah. So usually that point. just relates to anything with death or extermination. Yep. Okay. Good point. Okay. So a lot of these early insecticides would contain things like arsenic and other compounds and chemicals that we now know to be toxic and or carcinogenic. Carcinogenic meaning causing cancer. But once we discovered quinine, infected people were treated with quinine. So while the colonial Europeans would drink gin and tonics on a regular basis, so they constantly had quinine in their system to prevent malaria, in the US, we used it as a medication to treat already infected people. And of course, as if you're cured using quinine, you can't pass it on. So, you're, you're stopping the cycle of disease spread. And the biggest push came in the 40s and 50s. In 1942, the US formed the Office of Malaria Control in War Areas. Okay, now that's an interesting name. You gotta stop and think and unpack this, unpack this right? 1942, World War II. A lot of the military training camps were in the southeastern US. 
And this Office of Malaria Control was established to deal with mosquito-borne diseases in the southeastern U.S. Malaria, of course, was the biggest one. And because this was the biggest source of the problem was in the southeast, this was established and had headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, rather than in Washington, D.C. Isn't that what a CDC is? Yes. You taught us that. I remember these. Yes. <laughs> this later became Centers for Disease Control or the CDC, which is still based in Atlanta. So they worked on military bases, but they also worked in the rural communities. The rural homes were treated with this new compound called DDT. It was a new pesticide. And they treated over four and a half million homes. They also improved drainage around houses, eliminating standing water, more oiling standing water if they couldn't get rid of it. Today, most of the malaria cases in the US occur in people who are, have traveled to other parts of the world or in immigrants. And today, there are, well, okay, this was pre-COVID. 1,500 to 2,000 cases of malaria in the U.S. and five deaths on a yearly basis. So people are bringing it with them when they come to the U.S. All right, screenshot time. All right, now, we already know a little bit about resistance, right? We've talked about becoming resistant to treatments. So malaria has developed some resistance to quinine. And mosquitoes have developed some resistance to various pesticides. So we constantly have to change the pesticides we use. What are we using to deal with insects? And every time resistance develops, if we're talking about mosquitoes, you can get new outbreaks of mosquito-borne diseases, right? But with DDT in particular, it caused horrific effects on wildlife. You guys heard this story before? Yes, no, maybe? They too young, Professor. This is like late 80s, if you recall. Remember those commercials? <laughs> and they would show the plane with the fog coming out the back? You know, yeah, yeah, they're too young for that. Yep. So it nearly caused the extinction. Extinction's not the right word. I'm going to use the correct word. Extirpation of the bald eagle from the lower 40, 48 states. Extirpation means it's not extinct, but it doesn't occur in an area where it used to occur. So bald eagles used to occur all over the lower 48 states. They were nearly wiped out in the lower 48 states, but populations were fine in places like Alaska and Canada where they were not as likely to be exposed to DDT. Now, 
EDT also reduced populations of other birds and a lot of fish. In fact, if you look, no, I'm gonna say that in just a second. So, um, I mean, th this was a huge problem. You know, we're, we're killing off the fish and the birds. And this was when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, which was a warning call that all of these pesticides were killing off the songbirds. And what happens? Pesticides get on or inside the insects. The predators who eat insects then get the DDT in them or other pesticides in modern times. Um, and it just kind of moves up the food chain. And DDT does two things. First off, it does not break down quickly. And it does something called bio accumulation. So bioaccumulation. You are a black cap chickadee and you eat insects in the summer. And you eat a couple of insects that have some DDT and it's not great, but it doesn't kill you but it doesn't leave your body either. It doesn't break down, it stays there. And then you eat a few more insects with DDT and you get a little bit more DDT and you eat a few more insects with DDT. And now you get to the point where it's a fatal problem. So that's what bioaccumulation means. This also means it bioaccumulates in the bodies of people who eat fish that have DDT, or if people eat ducks, ducks will also bioaccumulate DDT. And it persists in the environment. So DDT in birds causes thinning of the eggshell. So the birds will lay an egg and the eggshell will be so thin that just sitting on the egg destroys it. When we look at bald eagle eggs from before DDT and compare them to modern bald eagle eggs, the eggshells are still thinner. There's still DDT in the environment it is still having an effect. Well, because it's still in the soil, correct? In the soil, in the water, yes. Right now, today. Yes. Jesus. It gets worse. It's, in, it's kind of insane, the impact that we've had on the environment. Like, there's like microplastics in all the food and like, DDT that's yes. like causing animals to like almost like die out like the bald eagles it's crazy yeah it absolutely is um there were a couple of mountain lion cubs found near where i live in california and um two of them died and when they did the, the autopsy on them, they found rodenticide. So rot, rat poison that people put out goes into the rats and then it goes into anything that eats the rats. Professor, you're in California? I am in California. I don't think anyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> you're in California? I am. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were here. No, no. So you live in Cali? I do now, yeah. I, I used to live in, in Massachusetts, 
um, and I was full time at, at North Shore. But when I moved to Cali, um, I wanted to keep teaching this class. So they're letting me teach it over Zoom for hopefully for years, because I love this class. Okay. So what else do we see? EDT, this is gonna cause you a, a little bit of questioning, um, causes high rates of cancer in marine mammals. So we think of DDT being sprayed on land. Well, it can end up in the marine ecosystems. But out here in Southern California, there's a big problem. EDT is at high levels in the blood of marine mammals. Higher than we would expect. And it's been going up. So what's going on? Rainwaters washing in the rivers to the ocean from the soil? No. No? Damn no. it. In 1972, DDT was banned in the US. At that time, one of the largest manufacturers of DDT was in the Los Angeles area. And when DDT was banned, the manufacturer was like, what are we gonna do with this? The stuff doesn't break down. And instead of being responsible, they loaded it up in barrels and dumped it in the ocean. Boston Tea Party. Well, they dumped the barrels whole. They didn't empty the barrels into the ocean, but they, they put it in barrels in the ocean, out of sight, out of mind. And of course, metal barrels in seawater are going to rust. And so these barrels are failing. So it's exposing the marine mammals to DDT, the fish off the coast of Southern California are gonna have DDT. I'm not eating locally caught fish. <laughs> um, and so of course it can go up the food chain again. All right, so go ahead and screenshot this. So what does DDT do to people? Well, we had an basically unplanned experiment on the human population. Because remember, we sprayed over four and a half million houses. Um, communities would spray DDT out of the back of trucks. So here's a, a truck and there's a worker. You see all the protective gear he's wearing. There's another one over here and the kids watching. They would spray from airplanes. So here's what we know. BDT disrupts hormones. And people exposed to BDT have higher rates of obesity and higher rates of cancer. Causes cancer in marine mammals. Of course, it's gonna cause cancer in people. This information is making me just want to like move out into the middle of nowhere and just like Alaska, get, away, Alaska. get away from like other human beings just so I can avoid this pollution. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. except unfortunately we can't avoid the pollution. It's everywhere. Yeah. Nate, did I see your hand go up? 
Yeah, but yeah. You, just, you just wrote it down. I was going to ask about its effects on fertility and whatnot. But, yep. Uh, you were worried ahead of me. Yep. So I would say what DDT does is what anti-vaxxers think vaccines do. Yes. <laughs> yes, quite, quite possibly. Um, so... Women who were pregnant when they were exposed with daughters, their daughters have or had higher rates of breast cancer an early onset to puberty, which early onset puberty is often um, associated with some health risks later in life. I see, let's see, it looks like somebody made a comment. Okay. Um, they have higher rates of infertility and their granddaughters have the same problems. The higher rates of breast cancer, the higher infertility, the early onset to puberty. So here's why this is, why I'm talking about the daughters. Men make sperm all the time. Their entire life, once they go through puberty, they make new sperm. Women, the cells that are going to become our eggs are, are already in our bodies when we're born. We don't make new eggs throughout our lives. They're all there before we're born. So while a woman is pregnant with a daughter, the daughter is exposed to these chemicals. These chemicals can go into her um can affect her eggs that will she'll use whenever she reproduces later in life. Could I actually um, state something that's like really like terrifying uh, and it's related to endocrine disruptors. It's something sure. I learned recently. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so recently I saw this like uh, graph, I think it was, I forget what association it was done by. But um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, uh, basically, it showed like testosterone levels in men um, throughout the past like 50 years or so. And it shows that like um, the average male in like the 20 in like the 2010s, for example, mm -hmm. has the same testosterone like the average 20 year old male in the 2010s has like the same testosterone as like a uh, 30 year old male in the early 2000s and the average 20 year old uh, or the average 30 year old male in like the early 2000s. Oh, I think we lost you. I think what he's saying is testosterone levels are going down over the years. I know that fertility is going down I know that um, when you compare stored sperm samples from several decades back, you find spot higher counts of sperm. So men used to produce more sperm than they do now. And modern sperm have a much higher rate of abnormalities than they used to. So there's a lot going on there, yes. Yes, uh, Stephen, that was that was that's a lot due to endocrine disruptors. Um, a lot of the endocrine disruptors are related to plastic manufacturing and plastic breakdown. Um, excuse me, can you hear me? I got disconnected yes. from the meeting a couple of seconds ago because my internet's being weird. Okay, no problem. Um, did you hear what I said though? 
Um, we heard the first part of it and I kind of filled in the rest. I'm pretty sure you were going to point out that testosterone is declining. Yeah. And I, I added that fertility is declining and um, in males, sperm counts are declining. Is that all you wanted to say? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very scary stuff. It yeah, is scary it is. stuff. <clears throat> Okay. So you can see that there was a lot of propaganda during the time period. This was literally an advertisement to in, tell people that uh, they should be happy about DDT being sprayed in the area. Yeah. And nowadays, there are places in the U.S., including Massachusetts, that, that spray pesticides to reduce mosquito populations. In Massachusetts, they tend to do it during the season where um, the mosquito-borne encephalopathies are. Eastern, I think it's Eastern equine encephalopathy. Um, there are a couple of those, though. So, yes, spraying pesticides reducing mosquito populations does reduce the spread of mosquito-borne diseases, but it's also impacting other wildlife in the area. We know, for example, that across the board, insects are in decline everywhere. This is something that terrifies me because if we think about the insects, they're kind of almost at the bottom of the food chain and they're disappearing. The whole ecosystem is dependent on insects. Um, this decline is being echoed in reduced bird populations. Baby birds have to be fed insects. So if the insects have been exposed to pesticide or there aren't enough, you're not gonna have as many birds being raised. And what are going to be the health effects on people 20, 30 years from now? All so right. they're gonna like the animal, they're gonna have less food to eat, which translates to us having less food to eat. Yes, it does. Damn. Yes. Off to Mars, off to Mars. <laughs> Now we have some advantages. Um, so a lot of our calories come from grain products, which do not require insects to pollinate. And a lot of our proteins come from domestic animals that can eat grains. So we'll have food, but there will be less diversity. Um, and while this is kind of off topic, whether or not people understand it, we are dependent on functional natural ecosystems for so much of our survival. Um, and if the ecosystems collapse, that's going to have effects on things like um, water purification that's done by aquatic plants, air purification that's done by various kinds of plants. Um, Trees help regulate weather patterns. So all of these things can, yeah. If we don't get our shit together, we're in a lot of trouble. Okay, and on that cheerful note, screenshot. Okay, so. Let's look at malaria today. So the yellow areas had malaria, um, the yellow areas until the 1900s. Oh, it looks like there was some on the West Coast here. The orangey areas until the 1940s. I don't. I can't quite tell some, there's some darker orange that lasted until the sixties, 
The red areas had malaria until the 70s, and the purple areas have or had malaria in at least 2002. So I don't have a more updated map. But you can see how worldwide the distribution of malaria used to be and how much it's declined over the years. So we're just into these areas that are purple. And I think it's declined since 2002. So I should probably go find an updated map. In 2016, half of the countries in the world had some malaria. The best estimate for 1916 was that there were just over 200 million cases of malaria and almost half a million deaths. 90% of those were in Africa and the majority of those were in children under five. So what do we do today to deal with malaria prophylaxis? And remember prophylaxis is prevention. Number one, window screens and bed nets. You may not have liked those bed nets, Jerry, but they help. They're relatively cheap and they're very effective at reducing malaria. So an insecticide treated bed net. This is not spraying the insecticide. The fabric has the insecticide in it. So if the mosquito lands on it, they get exposed to the insecticide. So it doesn't get into the environment nearly the way if you uh, spray, for example. Those cost about $5 to manufacture. Now, that's great, but people in the malaria prone parts of Africa, that's often a week's wages. Not every country in Africa is poor. Not every country in Africa has the same problems, but there is some serious poverty in parts of Africa. Um, can you afford to spend a week's wages on something like this? In communities that get donated bed nets, the, the deaths by malaria drop significantly. The deaths can go down by, um, I'm trying to remember the percentage, I don't have it written down. But they can go down, if you consistently use bed nets and everybody in the community does, the local malaria rates can drop almost to zero. So you can almost eliminate the disease from an area. Remember, the malaria that infects humans has to infect humans. If people, in an area are not getting malaria because of bed nets, the malaria parasite is not going to persist because it has to go into humans in order to survive. The other thing that is often done is indoor residual spray. So specifically what we're talking about here is spraying the walls. So after feeding, the Anopheles mosquitoes will um, rest on the wall. And they'll just, you know, kind of sit digesting on the wall for an hour. So if you have pesticides on the wall, again, you're killing the mosquitoes. And this has to be repeated every three to six months. 
to keep the local mosquito population down. But resistance is showing up. The third thing is taking medical prophylaxis, taking medication to prevent infection. Again, resistance is showing up. And these drugs are expensive and can have some serious side effects. So liver toxicity. Um, hallucinations, vivid dreams. We talked about these. Muscle cramps, rashes. So all of these things make it harder for medical prophylaxis to work. All right, this is a good time to screenshot. So Professor, one of the questions on the test was, does malaria cause various um, um, symptoms that are deadly? And that was a tricky question because it has various symptoms, but are these deadly ones? The malaria prevention here or the malaria, the disease? The disease. Yeah, the disease is deadly. No, it was saying the symptoms, the way the question, it was weird. I was like, man, it has a lot of symptoms, but are the symptoms deadly? Some of them are. Okay, cheer. I just didn't know, man. I got like three wrong of 25. I cried. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one too. It said, um, is malaria a type of plant or something to that extent? And I was like, I know it evolved from a plant, algae. So what is, you know, some is word it's tricky sometimes that I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so what's yeah. the answer? I didn't mean for that one to be tricky because <laughs> algae is not a plant. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. That was okay. That was me. Because some of these questions come back again. So I'm like, let's find out the real answer. So I don't want to get the same question wrong three on three different damn tests. Oh no, no, no! You don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> okay. So you got your screenshot. All right. So talking about scary things, scary things, climate change. Climate change is happening. We all know it. As the climate changes, mosquito distribution will change. So there will be some areas that have less water, fewer mosquitoes. Some areas that have more water, more mosquitoes. Warmer winters, more mosquitoes. And we're already seeing mosquitoes moving into new areas. Are they gonna bring diseases with them? Yes. Where are they going to bring the diseases? That is hard to predict. So we can't say specific areas, but it is a concern. Now, the fact that Americans have screens on our windows that significantly reduces the risk that things like malaria can, that have been eliminated from the US can come back because mosquitoes are mostly night active. And window screens keep them out. All right. What kinds of things do you have questions about? Those are my only two questions from the test. That was about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If nobody else has any questions, that wraps up malaria. Wait, I have a question about the quiz this week. Yes. I don't know if we're going to have a quiz this week. Okay. I was just wondering because it wasn't posted. That was my question. Yeah. Um, I'm having problems getting access to my North Shore email and Blackboard. So if I can get on later today, I will post a quiz. If I cannot get on later today, the quiz will be canceled because I'm not gonna, not gonna 
um, post something like say on Friday and ask you guys to get it in on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I would have posted an announcement, but I can't get on the blackboard. <laughs> You're not the only professor going through this, so. Oh, have you heard other professors with the same problem? Absolutely. I had a class that couldn't even start because the professor couldn't even get in to do Zoom. So, yeah, not just you. Not just me. That's good to know. All right. So. I do have a question. I'm sorry. Do, yeah. So people, if I present my project, do I get extra points or it's the same points if I just pass in a paper versus presenting? Same number of points. All right, cheers. Thank you. Um, I will tell you that uh, <laughs> I tend to be more lenient on presentations oh. because mm -hmm. a lot of students get stressed out about them. Okay. Me and Nate won't be stressed out, I'm sure. No, no, you guys are going to be fine. <laughs> um, also, Professor, yeah, I emailed you my presentation. I shared it with you. Okay. So if you have any time like coming up, do you think you could like look at it and get like email me back notes or something? If I can get into my email. <laughs> oh, you can't get in your email either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, great way to end the semester. Let's update the security and all the professors can't get into the, their accounts anymore. <laughs> we should just end school now. <laughs> no, I've got lots of good things to talk about in this class. Yeah, bioterrorism. Yes. What a, what a great thing. <laughs> I never promised that this would be a class that would make you happy. <laughs> It's going to scare you to death. <laughs> That's for sure. All right. Yes. Um, we're just going to introduce this a little bit. This lecture is very disturbing. Talking about bio warfare, biological weapons, bioterrorism. So all of these are intentional release of viruses, bacteria, germs that can sicken or kill people, their livestock and their crops. So I'm gonna type that up because this is the official CDC definition. That is a quote from the CDC. I will also say, I don't recommend doing Google searches for more information on this topic if you wanna have a good night's sleep. <laughs> now I wanna, why would you say that? <laughs> Why am I saying that? Because, oh my That's God. what happens when someone tells me like not to search something that I just want to more. Yeah, well, I didn't sleep well after writing this lecture. So um, yeah. I, I left out a lot of the stuff that, that, that kept me up that night. <clears throat> All right. So this definition, we can these weapons, these terrorist acts can be used to directly make people sick or kill them, or they can affect the food supply. So they can destroy crops, destroy livestock. They're often, uh, often used. They're not often used, fortunately. Um, but one of the other goals is to create fear. Any time biological weapons are used, there is a risk that the agents spread beyond the intended targets and cause problems for the group who released them in the first place. 
You know, if we as a class decided that the human race sucks, we want to wipe them out. We got hold of some smallpox, grew up a whole bunch and released it. Well, we'd probably all get smallpox and die as well as whoever our intended target was. All right. Are you laughing at me talking about killing the entire world? No, just self-destruction. You destroy your neighbor, you destroy yourself. Like if my neighbor's house caught on fire, my house catches on fire. And I'm sure that's really happened in real life. A neighbor's burned someone's house and then their house went on fire. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what can happen with, with this. All right. So if you want that quote, you can go ahead and screenshot it. So there is a very long history of biological warfare. We're starting with uh, the warfare part because this tends to be more common than bioterrorism. So what is the difference between warfare and terrorism? And Nate disappeared on us. Yeah, Nate, where are you, bro? Um, <laughs> I'd say warfare is things that actively happen. Terrorism is the fear of things actually happening. Okay, that's an interesting definition. Um, I would put it a different way. I would say that warfare is perpetrated by governments and terrorism is perpetrated by um, non-governments. Somebody funded other than by, but funded by governments. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Foolish man. Oh, it can be that very good. That was good. I like that. <laughs> what do you add? <laughs> <laughs> it can be very difficult to distinguish between biological warfare, bioterrorism, and natural outbreaks. Mm. And we know that the truth is often manipulated for political reasons. So especially when governments are involved, finding out the truth is challenging. And of course, the passage of time can kind of distort things. So don't really have time to cover anything else but I'm gonna mention that the first case biowarfare, which we're gonna talk about next time, was in 1400 BCE. BCE is the uh, modern way of saying BC. So if you're familiar with BC, BCE is the same thing. And we will talk about that one on Thursday. So everybody have a good couple of days and I will see you then. Thank you. Bye.